Hi, and welcome to the Streetwise Guide to Jupiter Security. I'm Rick Wagner, and my other presenter is Matthias Boussignet from Quansite, who unfortunately can't be with me today because no one else is allowed in this room. Matthias and I both have backgrounds in science, but we've decided that helping people do science through computing is really where our interests lie. Matthias has worked at UC Merced before moving on to Quansite and has been very engaged in the Jupiter community. You may be familiar with him and his work already. Myself, I work for the University of California, San Diego. I previously worked for Globus for a few years, and before that I was at the University of California, San Diego. One of the other things that's happened over the years is that I've got drawn into security more and more. And one of the things that Matthias and I have worked on in this slide deck, along with others, is to present a combined view of Jupiter with the security environment in a way that bridges some gaps, and we hope that this is helpful for you. Now, right now we're in the introduction. We're gonna talk about who this is for, hopefully you, and what the talk is gonna cover, and whether or not it doesn't cover what you need. So, and then we'll cover the full agenda. So who is this talk for? Hopefully you. Um, this is for users and implementers and security folks that want to know a little bit more about security and risk in the Jupyter environment. And these are the kind of questions that you may be asking and thinking about when you're trying to get Jupyter deployed in, a, in an environment that you're with. So if you're a PI or lead or an engaged user in the community, you might want to know how can I talk with systems or security staff about Jupyter and what things they need to look at for your systems. If you've been called upon to deploy Jupyter, either individual notebooks or a full Jupyter Hub environment, you're going to want to know what pieces are there. How do they talk to each other? What systems do I run on? And if you're in security, this, is, this may be new to you. It's got a lot of similarities to other stacks you may have deployed, especially ones that are interactive and leverage the web. But you're going to want to know, out of the box, what am I going to get? And then what do we need to do on our own to improve security for this specific deployment. This talk does assume a, some familiarity with Jupyter and its concepts. We don't go as deep into the background as we have previously because this is JupyterCon. But for those of you new to Jupyter, perhaps in those latter two categories of implementers or security staff, we try to cover enough and give you references so that you can learn more later on your own. So let's talk about this talk and the content that's gonna, gonna be in it. This talk is an introduction to Jupiter, in particular looking at the various components and how they relate to each other. This is a natural part of security, is knowing what's running, where it's running, and what other pieces it talks to so that if it needs to be encapsulated, we can focus on it, which is exactly what we want to try and enable you to do when you're putting it onto your systems. We're also going to go through as examples of how to configure or set up various features that are naturally part of Jupiter or easily enabled on the systems you're running on, like HTTPS or internal encryption, that might be useful for you. Explicitly, what this talk is not is a fixed set of security best practices or an explicit recipe or guide. There is no one size fits all. We're trying to present you with things that might be useful to you, acknowledge some of the risks that are present in the Jupyter stack, and give you areas to focus on as you proceed in securing your own environment. So the other thing this can never be is complete. Jupyter is an incredibly dynamic community. Cool things and new software are being written all the time. And so anytime we think we've got all the potential capabilities and implementations laid out, it's gonna change. So I'm looking forward to giving new versions of this talk based on updated security and new features and new ways of interacting and enabling science for years to come. This is the outline we'll go through. This is a rather long talk, but we've tried to break it up in ways that makes it easy to follow along and get the parts that you want. So after this, after this slide, we're gonna get into some background. We're gonna talk about this concept of what does being streetwise mean, as opposed to say being FISMA or FedRAM compliant. Touch a little bit on Jupyter. What are the components in the landscape? Make sure that we agree on our terminology and operational definitions for this talk. And then some other terms that you might, might want to be familiar with as you're working with Jupyter. We'll touch on how things connect, those pieces and the talking part, along with what threats could be presented based on what you're using. This is the idea of there's a lot of JavaScript going around. Where does it initiate? How does it get to the user? Where should we look at it and where should users be cautious?
Where should systems or security staff be cautious? And it'll boil this down into some practices that may suit you within Jupyter. Then we're going to have a long section where I demonstrate some of the hands-on things you can do and ways to look and inspect the whether or not those configurations are working. So we're going to look at Jupyter Notebooks and how to run them and ways to look at the particularly end-to-end -end encryption for some of the work that we do when we're running on remote hosts. There's a big difference when you're running locally on your laptop as opposed to when you're connecting to your or somebody else's computer. If it's your computer, you're going to worry that it's secure. If it's somebody else's computer, you're going to worry that it's secure and that what you're doing isn't at risk of those other people on the system. So we'll work through that and also include some other steps like external authentication and user management that might keep you from having a giant stack of username and passwords that end up on some website for other people to browse. Then we'll wrap up with some references and acknowledgements to the various people that have helped this project along the way. Let's get into the background. What does it mean to be streetwise? It basically means to be aware and have an instinct for what's going on, where you are, what you're doing, what's going on around you. Are you in a space where you're pretty comfortable being exposed and at risk, like your own home, your office, places like that? Or is it somewhere new and unfamiliar and you wanna get the lay of the land? Now, maybe that new and unfamiliar is a bank and that's probably pretty safe for a lot of activities, but maybe you're traveling to another city and you haven't been there before. So you can be a little bit more careful with your wallet and your backpack. Maybe you're staying at a youth hostel and you wanna take that backpack with you when you leave because where you're staying isn't as trustworthy um, as where you're going and when things are around you. This is what we mean. This is what we're trying to help folks, especially those that aren't in the security field and aren't as sure about what kind of data they're working with or the systems they're on, just to get a better idea of when to ask questions and when to back off, or better yet, when to be fully comfortable with the work they're doing and getting things done because they know that there's strong odds they're in a safe environment. There is some jargon that we should know. And these are related to various things within the community and Project Jupyter. Let's start with the Notebook app. The Notebook app is the JavaScript application that gets run in the user browser. It comes in two flavors, traditional and spicy Jupyter Lab. Next one is the Notebook server. This is a single user web server that serves the HTML and JavaScript to the app. So it speaks both flavors and is able to serve it up. It connects over WebSockets and a ZMQ bridge, and importantly, it starts kernels where the computation goes on. Now, the notebook server can read notebook documents or files. So notebook documents are the IPy YNBs that are JSON files and have all the content and cool stuff in them that can get shared, but they're read and written by the notebook server. The kernel is a separate process from the notebook server that executes user code. And it's got lots of flavors. And one of the fantastic things about Jupyter is that it does have many flavors, including Julia, R, MATLAB, Haskell. So there's some Fortran and C versions out there. For multi-user environments, you'll often see Jupyter Hub. Now, this is a set of processes and other components for a multi-user deployment. The hub itself is essentially a user database and a dynamic HTTPS proxy that knows how to spawn notebook servers, how to launch those. You might have heard a couple of other terms, namely Binder, which is a fantastic project that allows people to try code, try to share, no or allows them to share notebooks, etc. And it's authenticationless. So it's a lightweight, small scale process that's good for training and sharing, etc. Then there's Zero to Jupyter Hub. Zero to Jupyter Hub is guide and codes and configuration for deploying Jupyter Hub on Kubernetes, like Google, the Google Compute Platform or Kubernetes in-house or platforms running on other areas. It's a quick and straightforward way to get started if you're comfortable with that environment in spinning up a, a Jupyter Hub uh, platform. So this is the Jupyter Notebook server and its components. Looking on the left, you see you've got a happy user because they know they've got Jupyter to help them support their science. This box represents a system like a laptop. So the user starts the notebook server and this notebook server 
will start a kernel when asked by the user, and I'll demonstrate this in a moment, and then the notebook file gets read and sent back and forth. And so let me take a moment and actually show you briefly what this looks like. So I'm on my laptop and I've got a couple of terminal windows open. I got that one and I've got that one. So the command to start a Jupyter Notebook is just Jupyter Notebook. Again, I'm on my laptop. Before I do that, I've got this convenient for loop I'm gonna run in the background that's gonna look for a process running in Anaconda Python. I don't use Anaconda Python for any other regular processes, so I'll know that when the notebook server is started, it'll show up below here. So, starting the Jupyter Notebook. And I'm in Jupyter. And this is running on localhost. This is my laptop, and it's running on port 8888. And I can now see my entire file system. Something I want to point out in here is, first of all, we see the local host and we see the port. These are the URLs I can access it on while I'm on my laptop. You'll also notice that there is a token here. That token showed up in my window or in my URL, uh, my, my web address bar when I first launched this. And then down here, we can look and see that there is a Python process running, which is the notebook server. There's different ways to halt and start the notebooks uh, using the Jupyter command, but I am going to do the very simple and old-fashioned control C. It'll prompt me and I exit it. So that's what it looks like when you open it on your laptop. Another thing that's important to discuss are boundaries. Now, these aren't necessarily personal ones and how to deal with per people um, and still maintain your work-life balance in the age of a global pandemic. This is more about boundaries between the system that the software is running on and the rest of the world, which has some similarities, but not exactly what we mean. So here what we're discussing is if we assume that this box that I'm looking at here on the outside is the Jupyter is it a laptop or desktop you're running on. These are the things that are going on inside of it. You've got the browser you're running, it's connecting to the notebook server, it's reading files, and then it's uh, running the kernel. So with that, what if some of these things were running somewhere else? At the moment, everything that is remote is external. It's outside the boundary of the laptop. It's coming over your Wi-Fi or your LAN connection or whatever it is, and the rest of it we consider local. This is trust. This is we are comfortable working on our laptop. In some cases, although not commonly, you can actually spawn the kernel, the computation part, on another system, in which case there would have to be a network connection out to the other server. More likely is this one. This is something that users do very often, and it's very convenient. This is where you spawn the notebook server process and then you connect to it over the web. In this case, you've taken that boundary between the outside world um, and the things you're doing and put it in between you. There's an explicit point between the browser you're running where it has to reach out over the internet to connect to the processes you want to run. Let's get into this concept as well for Jupyter Hub. And here we're talking about Jupyter Hub and its pieces and the terms we use for it. So as we've said, Jupyter Hub is a multi-user environment. It has the hub, which authenticates the users, and it's various means to do that, and it spawns the notebook servers. This means that generally the hub has to have some ability to initiate processes either as or for the user. So there's different ways to do that through either batch systems or sudo. By default, you can run it as root or with sudo privileges that are equivalent. So that's already an area to look at. Once you've spawned it, it helps, it talks to the proxy, so the proxy can connect the user to their notebook server and the hub can get out of the way and its job just becomes to control the notebook server, starting, pausing it, restarting it, etc. Now, as I said, the hub can run by default as a privileged user. It's a little bit more advanced, but you can run it as an unprivileged user. This is recommended for places where you really don't trust uh, 
the system you're on and it's got a higher risk of um, exposure. Generally speaking, if you've got a multi-user environment, this is strongly worth considering. And very commonly, the hub itself and the notebook server might be on different systems. This is the hub doesn't necessarily have to have processes or notebook servers running on it. We'll talk about this more later, but I just want to make that, that clear up front. And in this case, the only application that is running on the user system is the app, the JavaScript that gets sent to the browser from the notebook server. So this is the same notebook server that we were talking about before. It's very convenient. That means if you know the code or manage the code there, it's the same one regardless of whether or not you're running on your laptop or on Jupyter Hub. And depending on who's managing the system, this does get into issues with maintaining consistency in terms of Python dependency hell, as we're familiar with. Thinking about our boundaries again, you have what is remote, which is everything that's gonna be external to your system, and what's gonna be local, which is everything that's running on your system. That's the user perspective. If you're an administrator and you're responsible for the hub, these things, oops, these things are gonna get flipped. You're gonna think of everything below the red line as being local and everything outside of it as being remote. Either way, there's a clearly defined boundary. So how does all this Jupyter Hub stuff work in a more dynamic view? Let's suppose we have three users that are connecting to a Jupyter Hub server. We have Rudy, Bobby, and Ginny, and they've got their browsers, and they want to connect to this Jupyter Hub server. This could be jupyterhub.example.edu, um, some other one. It could be one run by their lab, a campus facility, at their employers, wherever. So there's a server and they want to connect to it. So what happens when Rudy comes in and connects to the server? Well, in this model, what we're assuming is that there is a web server like Apache or Nginx that is fronting JupyterHub. This is a good practice because this way you've got control of your namespace and if you have to run other processes, et cetera, you've got Apache. Also, um, JupyterHub is its own software and gets developed. Sometimes it's better to have an older piece of software that can monitor and or has a little bit more eyes on it and more longevity than just the web server that's built into JupyterHub. Also, a lot of sites are very comfortable and familiar with configuring the security requirements for something like Apache. Now, Apache will have instructions, and I'll show you some examples of how to talk to the JupyterHub proxy. The JupyterHub proxy is going to be sending stuff back and forth to JupyterHub. Okay. Note, I need to cut that because I made a mistake with this. So how does all this Jupyter Hub stuff? So how does all this Jupyter Hub stuff work in a more dynamic viewpoint or perspective? Let's suppose we have three users, Rudy, Bobby, and Ginny, and they've got their browsers on their systems. And what they're looking to do is connect to a Jupyter Hub server that's either for their research group, their campus facility, their employer, et cetera. Maybe they just run it on their own because they're cool. And this server uses Apache. A lot of sites are familiar with tool or web servers like Apache and Nginx and how to secure them. So it's a good option to have up front to do one, the capture all the web requests and make sure the right ones are going to JupyterHub or off to other services that might be on this host. It also is a convenient way to do your TLS, transport layer security and encryption by terminating it at this web server for the entire host. So. We've got that, and then behind it, there's JupyterHub and the proxy. JupyterHub's gonna do the authentication, et cetera, and the proxy is gonna be the thing that eventually connects the user with the stuff they're gonna launch. So let's start with Rudy. Let's suppose they wanna connect, and they come in, and they get to Apache. Well, when they get to Apache, there's going to be a connect. Apache is going to pass on the requests to JupyterHub, which is gonna authenticate Rudy, and then choose to spawn. We'll do this in green to represent software running as the user. This is going to spawn 
we'll say a notebook server or notebook server for Rudy. That's the spawning process. Then Jupyter Hub is going to talk to the proxy and connect the pieces so that the communication from Apache goes through the proxy to this. Now, by default, what the proxy does is takes this URL and appends the username to it, which in this case would be slash Rudy. So that way, everything within Rudy's workspace is under that URL. Something I want to mention is this puts everything under whatever the primary host name or domain of the original Jupyter Hub server. It's convenient, it's easy to set up. If you have a lot of trust between users, this is just fine. Jupyter Hub does support subdomains, which is critical for avoiding cross-site scripting attacks. So instead of Rudy under a UR a subdomain or a sub URL or a path, you would have Rudy.example.jupyterhub.edu, whatever which means that then the process is running as Rudy and the process is running, say, as Bobby, um, can't send JavaScript between them, so they can't necessarily send the same stuff between browsers. All right, so once Rudy is connected and logged in and has a notebook server, they can start processes such as their kernels. and that'll connect and there'll be a communication flow from there and it'll go on back. Now, when Bobby comes along and wants to connect to Apache, the exact same process is gonna occur, but in this case, Jupyter Hub is gonna spawn a new notebook server And this one is gonna be for Bobby. And the same path setup is going to occur. The proxy will have a connection to it, but it's gonna be on slash Bobby. Or bobby.example.jupyterhub.edu, whatever it is. And as you might expect, again, all this stuff will happen in that. And when Ginny comes along, we get the same thing with all the processes happening on them. So this is the rough diagram of how things work in JupyterHub. It's nice and encapsulated in terms of what features JupyterHub provides for authenticating users, spawning notebooks, and encapsulating the various work pieces or processes running on the user. Now that we have a feeling for how the notebook server and JupyterHub work and what some of the pieces are, Let's cover some of the potential threats in the Jupyter stack and the, some of the things you can do as a user and as an admin to address them. So first, let's talk about threat models versus functionality. There's things that we want or need to do, and there's things that are risks. So one of the risks is arbitrary code execution. This is when you have a system and you're operating it, you want to know what's happening on it and what processes and tasks and commands are being executed. As a user, especially in research, well, that's kind of what we need to do. We're always pushing the boundaries and we explicitly need to do new things for research, which is a great thing because the Venn diagram of what we need to avoid and what we need to allow is complete. One way to think of this, is for especially for systems and security staff, you already have options like SSH and SSHD and the way to lo remotely log in and execute stuff on a server. In terms of security and functionality, Jupyter is largely similar. That's exactly what it's providing for the user, just with a much more convenient front end that is also more convenient for sharing um, and collaborating on the research that's going on. So looking through the stack, there's a few different places where we might want to look based on where uh, our suspected risks are. So the notebook app. The notebook app is a lot of JavaScript. And especially when we think of JupyterLab, 
which is an incredibly rich environment that enables components to connect, there's a lot of dependencies and libraries getting shared and connections. This is why I mentioned subdomains. As users start to run custom environments with their own JavaScript, you're gonna to wanna to put a little bit more effort into knowing what they're getting into and what, they're and what, what is being enabled in the browser. As a user, always throughout this, you're gonna to wanna to know what software you're running, both on your system and remote. So the notebook server should be run as an unprivileged user. That is, when JupyterHub spawns something, it should be running as you. Or in the case of, for example, Zero to Jupyter Hub, as a server process that can isolate things for you. And this has complete access to your environment. Even if you're able to lock down what version uh, and packages are in the notebook server you're running, it can still do pretty much anything you can because it's running as you. Notebook files get shared a lot and they contain code in them. It's one of those things like, if I give you something and I tell you a command, you know, maybe you should look at it first. Maybe you should examine it. One of the things I love these days is the number of examples on how to install packages that say, you know, as root, as an administrator, I want you to grab this stream off the internet and just pipe it into a shell and do exactly what it says. I trust a lot of things, but you know what? I also trust downloads and checksums and verifying that the stream that I'm executing is the stream that I'm expected to have. And by stream, I basically mean file. Kernels are computation engines and they run more isolated. They talk to the notebook app, but it does need to know that you're communicating to the correct kernel and then the, correct, the kernel is communicating back to the correct server. Not as high of a risk because they tend to be a little bit more isolated, but depending on the system you're running or the applications you're doing, it could be significant. And then there's JupyterHub, a multi-user environment that is very easy to stand up for a small work group, work group server and enable a lot of communication or collaboration. But perhaps you've got a less trusted environment where the users don't necessarily know each other or in very large facilities where there's a high probability that a single user account is compromised you're gonna to wanna to provide more isolation between your users. Even if you've got your own system and a handful of folks in your research lab that you trust, it's possible that you might wanna do something like use sudo spawner or other things so that if the system is compromised, there's a little bit less that can go on. There's a lot of information about the security model for the notebook itself. It executes code. There's a lot of stuff that's been built in to make sure that the commands executed in there are what the user wants to do. And I will say, no matter what, you probably wanna read the notebook server before executing it. If your colleague or friend shares a package, you're probably gonna to look and say, is this going to do what I expect? It's like a script or another set of instructions. If somebody's telling you which way to drive and you know, they're giving you instructions to the wrong side of town or, you know, to a dangerous curve, you'll want to slow down and take a look. It's the same thing. And also, we're all very busy and we're all excited about the science and people make mistakes. So read them, take a look, and make sure that you know what's going to happen when you're going to execute the cells in a notebook server. And for a lot more documentation, the URLs above. So if you're an administrator, what should you be doing to help enable users to do the right thing by default? The first one I'll say is users are going to want to install and use the tools that they need. So if you want to get ahead of them, provide a default means for them to execute Jupyter. Even if it's as simple as documenting a mechanism to use SSH tunneling to spawn a single notebook server, it might be a little complex, but that way you can help them to have that end-to-end -end encryption that they need and other features. Guide them. So a little bit of documentation may go a long way if you don't have the capacity for running something like JupyterHub. That's reasonable. That might be more effort than you can put in. Do your usual due diligence about tracking packages and updates. And then odds are it's a Linux box and it's gonna be on the internet. So you've got all your usual tools. You've got VPNs, you've got firewalls, You've got your familiar 
web servers, whether it's Apache or Nginx, and you know how to manage certificates and things like that. The next layer down is to look at the hub and the spawners. So the hub, you know, you want to make sure that it's if possible running as a unauthorized user and the spawners start code. So if you're running as root, it's got a lot of power and it can just launch things as users. For small groups that trust each other and everyone logs into a box over SSH anyways, maybe that's fine. If you've got a larger system, you might want to say, let's take the hub, put it outside somewhere else away from the system, just have it launch things and then figure out how you spawn stuff securely. If you need to, you can isolate the notebook servers. If you've got an HPC system or other distributed resource, that proxy will tunnel all the way through. And you can have the notebook servers running on individual hosts or in a shared environment uh, with processes for each user. And then there's things that we'll also get into, which is internal communication. There's a lot of networking going on over WebSockets and HTTP and even better, HTTPS. We're going to go through those. So this way, if you are going over less trusted networks or there's an odds that something gets compromised and you know somebody can listen to packets internally, we can work on that. And then finally, and this isn't as big of a barrier as it used to be, I strongly recommend some type of external authentication. By default, it's going to use PAM, and that might work if you're tied into some other system, but you really don't want to have usernames and passwords on the Jupyter Hub system unless it's the most convenient thing for you that suits your environment. Ideally, you're going to use something like OIDC or LDAP or something like that, and we're going to cover that as well. Let's get into the hands-on work. I'll admit, this is going to be a little bit of a whirlwind. This is normally a longer two-hour interactive session where people do this, some of this on their own. So don't take this as a technical step-by-step -step guide, but a way to watch and see the various processes to get an idea of how you might go about it on your own system and to really reinforce some of the things we talked about in the previous sections. I want to introduce you to a tool that we're going to use in a couple of cases to view unencrypted traffic on a host, and it's called TCP Flow. It's sort of like TCP dump, except it actually converts things when possible to ASCII output you can read. It's really good for capturing plain text across the wire, like tokens, JSON files, uh, passwords, usernames, other things like that. So you basically, it's a pretty straightforward program. You do have to run it as root because you are attaching to a network interface and you give it commands that say, listen on this port on this interface. So you'll see me using it on various times on the command line, and I just want to make sure I have this up for reference. We're going to start with the generic Linux host. This is batchtest3.jupyter-security.info, a domain we use to spin up instances for testing and training. This is pretty much a generic box, and it's got pre-installed Jupyter, Jupyter Hub, it's got certs from Let's Encrypt, and of course, it, in my case, I use Apache, and it's got TCP flow installed. There's not a lot of configuration here, except for the default configuration that Let's Encrypt does to add the certs to Apache. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to connect from a terminal on my laptop to SSH on the server. Once we connect, I'm going to launch a notebook server. This is manually like we did when I was logged in on my laptop before, and this is going to be listening on port 8889, but it's going to be listening on eth0, which is the interface that's mapped to the outside world. From there, I'm going to connect my browser to the interface which connects to the notebook server. I know this is a little bit um, extreme to actually show the interface it's going through, but there's a reason for that. And that's because I'm going to come in next and run TCP flow here and listen to the traffic that's being sent through that interface. And it's important to know that the traffic going through this interface is the exact same traffic that's going along this path. So if I can see something here, for example, a token, well, that means that anyone along this path can see it. So oh, here we are logged in to batch test three. And 
I'm starting up the Jupyter Notebook. I'm using the No Browser option so it just runs as a service on the host. I've specified the port, and you'll see there's a 10 net address in there. That's because this host has a private IP address that gets used and mapped through Elastic IPs out to the public side. Some hosts will have a public address and then you'd use that IP uh, to connect. So below, I've got a command to start TCP flow and I'm listening on ETH0 on a specific port and I wanna see if I can find that token. So now it's listening and I'm gonna launch the notebook server. There we go. Now, it gives us the two URLs that we saw before, but it's got that local 10 net address in there. So I'm gonna go over here to Emacs and take that string and replace this with batch test 3jupitersecurityinfo And this now is gonna direct my browser when I put it on my laptop to this, and you'll notice that it starts with HTTP. This is not an encrypted connection. I go, and I'm connected to the server. But when I go back and I see the output of TCP flow, there it is. There is the exact same token from here that I've captured here. So the point is, even though I'm doing this by running a process on this host, as I said, anywhere across the wire, this could have been captured. So great. Now we know that we need to encrypt this. So the recommended practice for a single server would be to actually take this connection and start a second SSH tunnel that would allow you to connect here. That's kind of an exercise left to you, the audience. There's lots of examples on how to do that online. And it really does depend a little bit on your host, especially if you're using Windows. The next thing we're gonna look at though is inside the host, because we're imagining this is a multi-user environment and there's things that we wanna constrain. We're gonna start a notebook. We're gonna launch it from the browser and that is gonna end up initializing and starting a kernel. The kernel's our computation engine. It interprets the output from here to here. And as we said, it can run on other hosts, but typically it runs on the same one as the notebook server. And we're gonna attach our testing tool, which I believe I was still using green for. And listen to that connection on the local device, because this all happens on what's referred to as the loopback device, the local virtual interface that connects processes. We're also gonna look at some of the facts of who we're running as and what types of things we can do when we are working on this host as the Ubuntu user. So here we are back in the application served up by the notebook server. Now, there's different ways to launch notebooks. One, you can use new. Um, one of the other things I'd like to point out here is the terminal, and this is literally a terminal. This just shows how directly connected you are to the system through Jupyter. This is very convenient if you need to move files around and look around and you just don't quite want to do that through Python. But I have an existing notebook that's going to automatically launch a kernel. Now when I look at that, there's a command I can run inside the notebook that shows me the connection info. And when it executes, it talks to the kernel and I get back a response with the various ports that things are running on. That took a little while. So we see here there is a port called IOPUB. This is the port that's used to communicate between the notebook server and the kernel. There's also a key that's used for validating messages between the two processes. So the port here, 59731. You can also see that if you go into the dot local share Jupyter runtime directory and look for the various files that are laid down to make it more convenient to open the notebook server or for processes to identify how to communicate. And we look at the, if we look at the kernel one, we'll see the exact same information, 3971, or sorry, 39731. So this time we're running on the loopback device. And we're gonna make sure that we type 39731. We're listening on that port on the loopback device. So we're gonna look for things going through here that say Ubuntu because that's the username. We could literally grep for username or other things like that. And then 
I'll execute something that looks at things in our environment. So it grabs various variables and spits them out because no one's ever stored a password or secret in an environment variable. But if they have, and you can listen to them communicate, you'll see it. So here we see a lot of the text messages, the messages back and forth between the kernel and the notebook server. The other thing that I think is important to point out is down here, we have a command that shows that we're just executing a simple command using sudo inside the notebook. And it's gonna ask, who am I when I run sudo? Well, I'm root because I'm running as a user that has sudo all privileges. Not the greatest idea if you don't need to. That means that even inadvertently, like when we talk about sharing documents, etc., you could erase something or change something that you don't intend to. It's often good to have a non-administrative account or require passwords, etc., for sudo, specifically for this reason. It's not about restricting what you can do, it's about preventing inadvertent changes or errors. Let's move on to JupyterHub. So this is similar to when we're looking at how Rudy, Bobby, and Jenny were connecting, except now we're gonna act as a non-privileged user called Researcher. So first we're gonna go in and very briefly configure Apache, JupyterHub, and that's about it. With those two configurations in place, we're gonna be able to, from my laptop, go from the browser, connect over to ETH0, which will actually encrypt the entire communication chain all the way to the Apache process because Apache has those let's encrypt certs that are gonna do the end-to-end -end encryption to the browser. Once JupyterHub authenticates the user against the local system password and database, the expected slash researcher path will be created on the host and then a notebook server will be started. And a connection will be plumbed through here. Let's go see what that takes to set up. Here I have the Apache configuration on the same host. The difference being I've gone in and added the lines here at the beginning to do an automatic redirect from HTTP to HTTPS for all the services that this, virtual, this host in Apache has. From there, down below, I added the necessary proxy rules for JupyterHub. So down here, it's basically gonna take connections from the outside world on port 443 with the right paths under slash jhub. So we're not taking over the entire web space of this server, but for slash jhub and redirect them down. So everything will happen under it and it'll update and modify the links in the pages as needed before sending it on out. I restart Apache. And the first thing I wanna check is if I go to the default site for this server, I noticed that it automates, might be hard for you to see, but it automatically took me from the HTTP link to the HTTPS link. This is also doing, browsers nowadays are checking the certs and the host names and things like that. Now, I've created this directory JupyterHub to store my JupyterHub config. There's a lot you can do with the Jupyter config file, and we're gonna do a bit more of that later. But first, let me generate the config. This will create a default file. And it's a just a Python file that stores things and can have a little bit of cold code. It's very powerful, and it's good to know the various options you have. After that, we're gonna start JupyterHub. So this is running a process as root for JupyterHub, listening on the local host and tells it the base URL. So without going into details as to why there's more windows open, there's now Jupyter running using the command, basically starting the proxy that runs as root on port 8000 so that Apache can connect to it to its proxy pass. Now that that's going, we can go up to our window 
put in that slash jhub sub to uh, path and connect to Jupyter Hub. It's an encrypted connection. All the traffic from Apache out to the browser is going to be gobbledygook. So I can go here and I have this user account researcher that's pre-set up, that's an unauthenticated, sorry, an unprivileged user. It is authenticated. And there's a few directories we could look at. So this gets us to the point. Actually, let's look at it over there. So we know our setup now. We know that this connection here is going to be unencrypted. We also know that this is unencrypted and exposed. But there are ways to fix them. In particular, we're going to use something here that's called I. PC, Interprocess Communication. That's basically going to use file descriptors as the means of communication between the notebook server and the kernel. Here, we're going to use internal SSL. These are going to be self-generated certificates that JupyterHub and the notebook servers trust to secure communication between them. While we're setting up internal SSL and IPC, there's one other option that you can use for authentication that I'd like to recommend at this point. And that's OIDC, OpenID Connect. This is the web-based login you're usually familiar with if you're logging in with Google or GitHub or your campus accounts, and it redirects you to a web page so you can verify the identity as the user of the identity provider that's authenticating you, confirming that you are you, and you can authenticate and prove that you are this user account. OIDC is very convenient and easy to set up, and Jupyter Hub has put a lot of work into having a reusable uh, OAuthenticator plugin with lots of services that are supported. So the way OIDC is going to work is when the user connects, Jupyter Hub is going to know how to reach out to the one that it's configured for. That is going to interact with the user's browser, and when that successfully completes, the user will be authenticated. It's pretty easy to set up if you go to your OIDC server and you get a client ID in secret and you tell the service, whether it's Globus, GitHub, CI Logon, et cetera, what the callback URL is to your server. So we're gonna wrap all these up all at once so you can see them working together. So here's our new JupyterHub config file. I put all the changes at the top. That's not really how I would do it in production. But since we're only making a few specific changes, I thought it'd be okay to group them. So the first one is, these are the changes at the top to set up internal SSL. This is basically saying, what's the host name, the server that I'm operating on that I need to tell my notebook servers about, and where are the certificates stored? There's also a command I noted above it that where you generate the certs. All of this is in the JupyterHub documentation. I'm just pointing it out so you know where to look. The second one below that is the spawner arguments. Every spawner has various options you can pass to it. And the one in particular here is the communication that's being, option that's being used for communicating for the notebook server and how it communicates to its kernels. And we're specifying IPC, the file descriptor based communication. And then below that from the Jupyter uh, O-Authenticator plugin, I've specified the Globus O-authentication or OIDC option. A lot of that has to do with the fact that I'm very familiar with it. Um, and you see there's the callback URL that I mentioned and the client ID in secret. Those of you uh, that are looking at the secrets and wondering why they're open, like I said, this service and host isn't gonna exist by the time you watch the video. And finally below this, there is when you have things like Globus configured, a lot of them can get tokens from the OIDC service to call others. And so there is now a section in the Jupyter user database for storing user session information in an encrypted manner. And so you have to specify a key that you pre-generate to secure that section of the database. This is really useful because now you can pass in secrets for the Jupyter user environment for things like spawning or accessing other APIs, and it still have them secured within the user environment. So with this, we can now run 
that command and JupyterHub starts up as before. But instead of seeing this option when I go to log in, when I refresh the page, it says sign in with Globus. Now, one option that I turned on that you really need to think about and configure is whether or not to create system user accounts when people log in. If you're running a big training or demo site and you want everyone to be able to log in and create an account, that's great. Um, you'll automatically create them and they'll be able to do stuff. Or maybe you wanna restrict that down and make sure that those system accounts already exist and you limit it to those users that have them. Also, there are options in the various authenticators to map from the usernames you receive back to your local accounts. You'll have to look at the authenticators to do that yourself. Now that I've removed the leading space from my client secret, I'm gonna sign in. I had to go sign out of Globus, but now that I have, I can go and select my identity. I have a lot of identities and they're all linked through Globus, which is convenient, but I'm gonna use my campus one, UCSD. When I go to UCSD, I'm presented with the standard familiar login page. I know that I'm on my home institution's login. I log in, I get my duo push, I'm holding my phone, I approve it, and I'm logged in. Now, I wanna be clear, options for MFA and things like that are very dependent on the identity provider you use and how the OIDC server is logged up or logged in. I'm great. Now that I'm logged in, I'm gonna do a couple of things. First, I'm gonna start a new Python window. Now that my kernel's ready, we can look at that connect info. And we see that our IOPUB ports are now very low numbers. That's because this is using the file descriptors that we discussed using IPC. So that's the spawner arguments working appropriately. The other part that we can look at is if we go and look at this nice verbose log that's being spun out by Jupyter as it's running, we can see where I connected. And somewhere down here, we see that it set up a route to my environment. So there's a port, 34495. Let's look at what the traffic looks like going across the local interface for that port on this host. If I go back and do something in the notebook, whoa, where's all that nice plain text? So this is actually the encrypted connection that we're looking at from the JupyterHub proxy to the notebook server. So now we've got a JupyterHub environment that has external authentication, the communication from the proxy to the notebook server is encrypted and the communication from the notebook server to the kernel is encrypted, all with a few options. We're gonna go look at the diagram one more time and I'm gonna show you why the encryption from the proxy to the notebook server might even be of more benefit when you have a distributed environment. So if you have a research cluster, an HPC system, maybe some other services in the background, you can run your JupyterHub server separately as a distinct host. The great thing about this is you can run your other processes like Jupyter and the JupyterHub proxy as unprivileged users where they do need to be able to have the ability to spawn the notebook servers on the remote, remote host. There's a lot of different examples of how to authenticate that. There's SSH spawner, there's batch spawner, and I think there's a lot we can do with the tokens from OIDC, but that's kind of a new area because HPC systems traditionally haven't really worked with OAuth type author or authentication or authorization for spinning up processes. I think that'll change over time, but I also like a lot of other dreams. So with this environment, the user's logging into here and the connection from the browser to the user is here. So you're securing this web host distinct from your cluster. Then the encryption, as we know from the proxy to the notebook server is encrypted. And we know that we've isolated on this compute host, the connection from the notebook server to the kernel assuming they're running on the same host. There is one area that's still exposed, which, you know, you can't do everything, and that's kind of a traditional model for uh, hosts within uh, web services and things like that, where you run the some web services and use Apache for a proxy. That's the reason we put these other things up front. If you really wanted to, you could figure out how to get Apache to trust the internal certificates from the other proxy. But again, with your own spawning implementation, the 
external authentication, the internal uh, encryption and traffic isolation there, we've done a lot to isolate and constrain the potential uh, attack surfaces for Jupyter. Wrapping up on user management, number one thing you've got to decide is what we just discussed when you're using the authenticators is whether or not to automatically create the system or user accounts. That's really up to what you need out of your system. And then there's various options you should just check the documentation for about who can log in and what groups they're in and who can't log in and what groups they're in and stuff like that. And then who can do admin things in the hub context like start and stop servers. You can write your own custom authenticator. I would say to use caution, you are literally saying who can get into your system. For some identity providers, they're actually federating other identities. And you wanna make sure that for those, you have some way to disambiguate what they authenticated against versus who you think they are on the system. There's various ways to do that, and you should look at some of the pull requests on the authenticator site if that's of interest to you. Let's take a few minutes to wrap up. There's a few Jupyter resources I wanna make sure I point out for you. You might be familiar with these, especially if you've been browsing the Jupyter sites during this conference or other times. The first one is the Jupyter community links. These are links out to the various projects and other activities within the Jupyter community. I highly recommend looking at it to see where you can get involved and engaged. The next one is documentation. I really like how Jupyter over the last couple of years has started to aggregate the documentation for a lot of the various projects and components into a single place. And I think of like security and this other work being related to that and looking across the Jupyter ecosystem and seeing where we can contribute to provide various facets into what's going on in the community. Now, there are two particular links that I think you should take some time if you're focusing on Jupyter and, and the security realm. The first is security in the Jupyter Notebook server. This is what we discussed a bit earlier when we were talking about how HTML is handled and cells are evaluated and um, how it's authenticated using tokens when it's running by itself. So this is the one that if you're thinking about the Notebook server, you should go in and take a look at. The next one is the security overview for Jupyter Hub. These are the practices that people from that use Jupyter Hub in a lot of different situations engage with. So you can update it, you can comment on it, but if you're new, you should probably just read it and get a feel for it. The other thing that's important to state is that Jupyter does take security very seriously. And there's a group of dedicated developers and steering council members that monitor a security list in case of vulnerabilities so that they're handled in a professional manner appropriate to the community and the risk involved. So you can email security at ipython.org and they do have a PGP key. Please keep that in mind if you spot something either in a dependent package or in software developed by Jupyter. Other ways to get involved is there may be, and we hope to have, a best practices workshop. This is one that was planned as part of the J Jupiter Community Workshops effort this year, and well, it's this year and it's been paused. So we're looking to move it online and do it in a couple of weeks in small chunks because we're becoming a little bit more adept and comfortable with doing things over Zoom or whatever mechanism we choose to interact. This is being organized by myself and Roland Thomas out of NERSC. And we're thinking about 20 participants. Now this could go up and down depending on who's interested and what their skill sets are, because we want to ensure we have a good cross section of not just interested Jupyter developers, but also folks that have experience on systems that are experienced with Jupyter and new to it. And along with security, we want to make sure that we bring in folks who have the domain expertise for the types of systems and environments that Jupyter would get deployed in. The goal would be to come out with some best practices for different uh, environments or architectures that we would see, whether it's individuals or modest scale systems or large scale systems. And also to consider whether or not there's any feedback we can give to the Jupyter community in terms of practices or development processes that could improve from a security perspective, the state of things. Overall, I think the Jupyter community is fantastic and engaging people in figuring out how to provide quality software while including a variety of different perspectives and it's only led to the betterment of the project. If you're interested in the best practices workshop, the security best practices workshop, please email me at rick at ucsd.edu.
Finally, there's always the chance to give thanks. And I would like to thank you for attending this, and I hope that you found it useful. I certainly enjoy presenting this and finding a way to give back to software that benefited me during research, and sometimes still does when I'm having uh, some fortunate weeks. So number one, Project Jupiter and Fernando for creating this project. Uh, I'd like to thank Kay Avila, who helped me with the last tutorial version of this for Perk 20 and Mark Krenz from Trusted CI that really kicked the first one off at last year's NSF Cybersecurity Summit. And I'd also like to make sure that I give thanks to UCSD's Educational Technology Services. This is the group that has this room that I'm standing in that enabled me to put together a high quality presentation on such short notice. So for other campuses that are considering how to provide resources for people to present materials while stuck in COVID um, and dealing with other things, or I think long-term, this is a great resource. Look at studiou.ucsd.edu. Um, it was fantastic to learn about, and I'm really glad that I got to use it. And thank you all, and I hope that you're having a wonderful JupyterCon 2020.